What is up, you guys? So welcome to this series entitled Machine Learning with TensorFlow and Scikit-Learn. Let's talk about multi-class classification. So in the previous lectures, we only dealt with one type of classification, that is the binary classification. Even though the nature of the MNIST problem is multi-class, we looked at it as a binary classification problem. That is, given an image, we want to detect if it is a certain digit or not. Whereas binary classifiers distinguish between two classes, multi-class classifiers, also referred to as multinomial, classifiers can distinguish between more than two classes. Now we're going to distinguish between some algorithms so that the picture is clear. So some algorithms that inherently could handle multi-class classification are random forest which we already saw but we didn't discuss. We're going to leave this for future lectures when we talk about ensemble learning and we've got the naive Bayes classifiers right whereas for binary there's some algorithms strictly for this purpose that is binary classification such as support vector machines and linear classifiers. However there are various strategies that one can use to perform multi-class classification using binary classifiers. For instance, one way to classify the handwritten digits from 0 to 9 is to train 10 different binary classifications. So say we've got a binary classifier, whether SVM or linear, for digit 0, another one for digit 1, and so on. So we've got 10 of those. And bear in mind that each and every one of those binary classifiers conduct one task. That is, they answer if the given image is, for example, a 1 or not, is a 0 or not, or is a 9 or not, right? If you if you feed this, the last binary classifier, if you feed it the digit, let's say 6, it won't be able to tell you if it's a 6. It's just going to tell you that it's not a 9, right? So one strategy to perform multi-class classification using simple binary classifiers is to train each and every one. Let's say the first one you train it zero versus non-zero and the second one you train it for digit one versus not one and so on and then when you want to perform prediction or classification you get the decision score that we talked about so a decision score gives you a, a number between minus infinity and plus infinity so the lower it is you say that the image is most probably not a given image. And the higher it is, you say that it is. The normal threshold will be zero, but as we discussed in the previous lecture, the threshold that you're going to be setting really um, will change the precision and recall metrics of your classifier. So given a satisfactory threshold for each and every classifier, you get a decision score for each classifier for that particular image. So let's say, I gave this guy a zero and the same image you pass it to this guy so so all those are getting let's say the image zero and you take a look at the decision score of each and every one of those classifiers and then you pick the largest decision score so let's say in the nominal case that the first classifier gave you the, the highest decision score. So you say my image is a zero. This is actually called an OVA strategy, a one versus all strategy or one versus the rest, right? Because really you're, you're taking a look at the largest one versus the rest, at the largest decision score versus the rest. Now, another strategy would be to train a binary classifier for each pair of digits. So in our case, we've got 0 till 9, so that's 10 digits. So you'd want to train 0 versus 1, and that is one binary classifier. So it tells you if the input image is either a 0 or a 1. Then you train 0 versus 2, and so on. Then the last one is a 0 versus 9. And then for the 1, start with 1 versus 2, not 1 versus 0, because it's already done in the previous layer of classification of binary classifiers, right? So you've got a one versus three and then a one versus eight. And you continue doing this till you reach the last one that is eight versus nine, right? So with that said, how many 
binary classifiers do I have over here? Actually, the formula for this is actually n, n minus 1 over 2, where in our case n is 10, so 10 times 10 minus 1 over 2, that's a 5 times 9, which is a 45. So you get 45 binary classifiers. You've got a lot of classifiers over here, so the thing would take a lot of time. Now, unlike OVA, the strategy, which is called OVO, one versus one, since the classifiers are inherently built as one versus another particular digit, the training data for each and every one of those classifiers are smaller in size than the OVA. So in OVA, you're giving the same training data for each and every one of the classifiers, right? Whereas in OVO, you're giving for example, for this guy, you're giving only the training data that are labeled 0 and 1. And for this guy, you're giving only the training data that are 0 versus 2 that. So that might speed up the OVO multi-class strategy. However, you're ending up with 45 classifiers, which is pretty much a lot. And how does this thing work? Well, after training, when you want to classify an image, you have to run the image through all the 45 classifiers and see which class wins the most duels. We'll see an example on that when we're coding with Python on Jupyter. Now, the question here is, what algorithm are you going to use? What training method are you going to use for each and every one of those classifiers? Well, some algorithms such as SVM scale poorly with the size of the training set. So, so for these algorithms, OVO is preferred. So if you're using an OVO, then you'd probably prefer an SVM algorithm. Since as we mentioned, the training set is smaller for each and every one of those classifiers. However, for most binary classification algorithms, OVA is preferred. So you've got less number of classifiers. Now we go back here to Jupyter Notebook. Um, when you perform, let's say the stochastic gradient descent classifier on all the training sets, say. Not as before where we, you know, partition six or not six, no. Let's perform the training, so dot fit on all the training set. Run this. Actually what's going on here is that when you use scikit-learn and you pick a certain binary classification algorithm for a multi-class classification problem, it automatically runs OVA. So under the hood, the OVA strategy is used to perform multi-classification with the exception of SVM classifiers. So if you use SVM classification, which we'll see in future lectures, an OVO strategy is taken due to the reason that we just mentioned. Smaller training set, SVM works good. Larger training set, SVM scales poorly with large training sets. So the training is done. So let's take a look if we want to classify a certain image. So let's say I predict, I don't know, let's say x32 said, so the classifier said that this image is a six. So it automatically did multi-class classification, right? But it's good to know that, as we said, beneath the hood, an OVA strategy is taken. And hence for this particular problem, SGD classifier used 10 binary classifiers. So let's see if it's actually a six. Well, yes, it is. Change the number. So this is a zero. There you go. You can go ahead and play around with this multi-class classifier, okay? So as you can see with what? Two lines of code, you can perform multi-class classification. That was easy. Using SGD classifier, it took us like two lines of code. And to see that indeed we have 10 binary classifiers, well, you can, you can actually run the following. So let's say I call SGD classifier dot decision function, right? On the same input digit, so X130, that is a three, as you can see here. Um, so run, we've got a 10 sized array. Each is the output of those binary classifiers, right? So I inputted here a three, as you can see here, the input to this OVA layer, I would say is three. And we're taking a look at the outputs of each and every one of those binary classifiers. So the decision scores. And since the output of predict was three, then it must be the case that this guy is the largest quantity because the first score corresponds to image zero, the second one or image one and so on. So it's this guy that is the largest. And notice that all the others are negative, whereas this guy is the only positive quantity, right? Let's try doing this for other images. So here's a lousy seven, right? It's a seven. 
um, run. As you can see, <laughs> this is lousy, right? All the quantities are negative. So there is no quantity that actually exceeded zero as was the case with the three, right? Over here, all of them are negative, but who is the largest? It's this guy. And it indeed corresponds to number seven. Now we can see why they're all negative. It's because this is a lousy seven. Let's try picking out another image. So that's a four. Okay. Now this might be, I don't know. Let's see. Yeah, there you go. That's a good four. It's the only positive quantity, right? Okay. So this is what happens beneath the hood. Now, if you, if you really, you know, if you really want to force scikit-learn to use OVO, you can use the one versus one classifier. So from sklearn.multiclass, right? Import one versus one classifier. Now this, after importing, all you have to do is just create an OVO classifier, right? And call one versus one classifier and you'd pass it the SGD classifier, right? Because you want SGD to be performing. One versus one is a strategy. You want to tell it that my OVO strategy is based on SGD classification, right? So you run this and then what you'd want to do is fit the training versus the test, right? The training set, right? I'll allow this some time. This might take a lot of time. So you have to be patient in this particular line of code. There you go, it's done. After that, let's go ahead and perform some prediction. So predict a certain image, say X 130, which it said it's a three, right? So to convince yourself that OVO is actually using 45 classifiers, all you have to do is go ahead here and call the estimators. Over here, you've got all the SGD classifiers. Look at them. You've got a number of SGD classifiers. Now, to count how much, all you have to do is pass the LEN, the length. There you go. 45 classifiers. Now, this is in case if you want to take an OVO strategy for multi-class classification. Now, if you want to perform a random forest, we've seen this in the previous lectures, but let's do this again. So forest classifier, I think we have it defined somewhere here, right? Yeah, it's over here. So in case you didn't, you know, in case you're not using the same Jupyter notebook as the previous lecture, in case you opened a new Jupyter notebook, well, you have to create it again, right? And even more, you have to import it. Right. So after making sure that you have an instance of the random forest classifier, um, you go ahead and you fit as we did previously the training set. Right. Okay. So it's done. And notice that this in random forest we did not specify whether it's OVO or OVA because it's not it's irrelevant. Random forest can directly classify instances into multiple classes. Right. So you can now after training you can perform prediction using predict proba as such. Well, you could have done this and it told you it's a three, but to be more, you know, as we did here with the decision function for the SGD classifier for the OVA, um, in case you want to be more explicit, um, you can call the predict proba as such predict probabilities. So you get an array as such, and it tells you the probability that the input image is, let's say image number zero. So with probability zero, this image is a zero <laughs> with probability zero. This image, which looks like this is a one and with probability 0.01, this image is a two with probability 0.96, which is the largest probability. This image is a three and hence it wins. So, so hence for its classifier will predict the input image as a three, right? And by the way, you can see that this particular classifier is fairly confident about its prediction. You can see that there is a 0.96, right? 0.96 probability in the fourth index. So image number three, which means that the model estimates with 96% probability that this image is a number three. So it not only tells you, right? It not only tells you that this image is number three, no, it gives you, it labels a certain probability, right? In many applications, this is very useful, right? Because let's say, you know, with, I don't know, with 40% or with 30%, the given image is, let's say four, okay? 
Um, look at this case, for example, with, with probability 84%, the, the, this image is a 7. Or with probability 88%, this image is a 4, right? So this is something useful because let's say, for example, you got an image with probability, I don't know, 30%, right? Um, that this particular image is, I don't know, 4 or 5. So maybe you can implement something else that could even give you more confidence about this image, right? You can embed another classifier in parallel with random forest to tell you that this image, oh, it is most probably, a, you know, for example, a four or a five, right? Now, of course, you want to evaluate these classifiers as we did with the binary classification to see their corresponding performance. and. One way to get the job done is using the cross val to get the cross val score. So we pass it the SGD classifier along with the training set. And you mentioned that you want your scoring to be accuracy, right? So you get the following array and it gets, uh, let's see, 89, 87, 85, almost 87% on all test folds. Right now, if you used a random classifier, you would get around a 10% accuracy. So this is not a, this is not a bad score. What you got is actually pretty good, but you can still do better. You know, for example, simply scaling the inputs increases accuracy. So what I mean, we didn't talk about pre-processing, but we will along the way. Um, so we can do this using the standard scaler, call up a standard scaler as such. Then you'd scale, right? You'd scale your features as such. So you have to cast it as a float because they're unsigned eight bit integers. So you do this. And then finally, you'd compute as previously the cross val score, but this time with the scale, right? With the scale training set. And as you can see, the cross validation score has increased by, I don't know, two, 3%. So from values around 87, we now have values around 91. The idea here is that scaling improves accuracy, right? So it's around 91, whereas previously it's around 87. Let's do this with, let's repeat the previous cross validation with let's say three folds, right? And the scaled one as well and have a, you know, tighter range of scores, right? Instead of five, it's better to look at three. I mean, for the time being, but it's really project dependent. And there you go. So values in the unscaled case are around like, 87, 88% as we saw previously. And with a scaled training set, they're around like 91%, right? Okay, so let's say you got a certain model and you want to analyze the type of errors you're making, right? Or the model is making, right? So first you can, you know, take a look at the confusion matrix as we discussed previously. So let's do this in our case by calling as we did cross val predict on the model and this time on the scale training set along with the responses. So this took a bit of time, but it's okay. Um, next thing you'd call the confusion matrix by passing in the training responses and the cross validated out y train predict, right? Now let's take a look at the confusion matrix. And as you can see, that's a lot of numbers. It's, it's somewhat difficult to, you know, take an idea of what's going on. But as we said previously, ideally, and your model is really a good one, then the off diagonals should be as low as possible. Ideally, they should be zero, right? But so the, the smaller, the better. And in turn, the diagonal elements should be as high as possible. Well, here the confusion matrix is 10 by 10, right? So with 10 by 10, you can see that it's hard to read. Imagine if you have a confusion matrix that is 100 by 100 or 1000 by 1000, well, what do you do? So in that case, what preferable or even more convenient is to look at an image representation of the confusion matrix. You can achieve this using the match show. So you'd want to show your matrix. You pass it the confusion matrix, right? Along with the show. Now this is a colored image. The more colorful it is, the higher the entry is. So for example, at zero, zero, which is this element, since it's high, then you see a colored image. Well, 
you should have had the color scale right here to show you the, the amplitude as a function of color, right? So instead of this, what we will do is specify the color map that is a gray scaled image, which is more convenient because the whiter the guy is, the whiter the entry is, the higher it is, and the darker, the lower, right? So taking a look at this image is way better than this matrix, right? And as we can see, the confusion matrix looks fairly good since most images are on the main diagonal, which means that they were classified correctly. Now, as you can see here, the entry five, five by row five, column five is the darkest along the diagonal because it's grayish, right? It's somewhat in between white and black, which could mean that there are fewer images of fives in the data set or that the classifier even does not perform well on fives as on the other digit. Okay? Now, in fact, you can verify that both are the case. Let's focus the plot on the errors. First, you need to divide each value in the confusion matrix by the number of images in the corresponding class. So, you know, you can compare error rates instead of absolute number of errors, right? Which would make abundant classes look unfairly bad. So the way you can do this is by calling the confusion matrix. Actually, shouldn't have called confi. Let's call it confusion math because there's a function called confusion matrix. So you should pay attention to that. So there you go. We did a mistake. Now we cannot call this. So the way you can do this is by using the Dell keyword, Dell confusion matrix. And as you can see, I deleted it. So going back up here, I can recall line of code. So you need to re-import it so that it works. Touch. And there you go. This time we're calling confusion underscore math. Right? And now I'll do a sum along the rows. So confusion math dot sum and I'll set the axis equal one. Keep through. There you go. If I take a look at row underscore sums. It's a 10 by one array summing up the row element. The way I could normalize my confusion matrix is by just dividing each row by corresponding sum. Right? right? So now I am sure that that the sum along the rows is one. A way to verify is by just summing along the rows. Okay. So now let's fill the diagonal with zeros. Keep only the errors, right? What you can do this is by filling the diagonals with zero. As you can see over here, the diagonals are set to zero. And then I'll plot as we did here, the normalized confusion matrix on a gray scaled image of plot. Right now, you can clearly see the kinds of errors the classifier makes, right? Because previously, those were too high that, you know, errors over here do not show. So for example, I cannot differentiate between 140 and 2, right? I just cannot. But all those guys are really black so how can i know so what we just did is you know just zeroed out the diagonal entries because that's not my main purpose and i just you know want to take a look at those errors occurring at the off diagonal so we can see that the columns for eights and nines are quite bright well at least they're brighter than others you can see the brightness over here and over here which tells you that many images get misclassified as eights or nines, right? Because this is high, so we're mistaking a lot of images, one, two, three, four, five, with eight, and one, two, three, four, five, forget about this, seven, eight, with a nine, right? Similarly, if we take a look at the rows of classes eight and nine, they're also relatively bright, telling you that eights and nines are often confused with other digits. Now, conversely, some rows are pretty dark. For example, row one, row one, which means that ones are classified correctly. So the darker, the better, right? And you know, a few are confused with eights here, but the most digit that's getting mistakenly classified as eight is the five because five is really bright on the eighth column, right? Notice that the errors over here are not perfectly symmetrical. So that said, this is not a symmetric matrix, right? Otherwise, this, the color here would be found over here. Color here be the same as the color here. Well, a way to, to take a look at this to convince yourself if you're not into colors is by just 
taking a look at the matrix and its transpose. So let's subtract both the transpose and the matrix itself. It's not perfectly zero, so the matrix is not perfectly symmetrical. Now, analyzing the confusion matrix can often give you some insights on ways to improve your classifier. Now, looking at this particular plot, it seems that our efforts should be spent on improving classifications of eights and nines, right? as well as fixing the specific 3 over 5 confusion. For example, you could try to gather more training data for these digits, or you can perform feature engineering that would help the classifier, for example, writing an algorithm to count the number of closed loops. Example, if you have 8 has 2, right? Or you could pre-process the images using, I don't know, maybe scikit image or pillow, or even OpenCV to make some patterns stand out more, such as closed loops. Now, analyzing individual errors can also be a good way to gain insights on what your classifier is doing and why it is failing. But, you know, it is more difficult and time consuming. Imagine you're, you're trying to correct errors, error by error. For example, let's plot examples of threes and fives, right? So class, a and class B are three and five, right? Now, let us extract those particular classes such, and we'll do the same thing for B, so class B, and we'll do A, B, and B, A, okay? Now, let's plot, let's plot a figure with subplots, plotting A, B, B, A, A, B, and B, B. So let's say, let's create a function over here, plot digits, Um, what I'm going to pass is instances and i'll also set image per row okay and some options size i'll set it to 28 to be taken as the minimum between the length of instances and image per row right next i'll extract the images instance dot reshape size by size and then i'll define the number of rows the length of instances minus one divided by images per row plus one Let's initialize the row images as something empty and define the number of empty images, number of rows, images per row, minus length of. At each time I'll append as such, then I'll loop over each row, right, where I extract the associated image and I'll append onto the rows as such. And this time we'll have to concatenate with appropriate dimensions. But last but not least, I'll concatenate over the columns and I'll plot using plot imp show the image on a binary color map using mpl.cl binary i'll pass the option I'll axis set it to off let's go here and try this function so plot underscore digit xaa for row let's set it to five there's an error saying okay let's specify the size of the image so fig size which says that mpl is not defined so back down here from so mpl is included in matplotlib such go back here and there you go Okay, let's plot the AB plot, touch, plot BA on another subplot, plot BA on another subplot, and there you go. So as we can see over here, the two 5x5 five five blocks, this one and this one on the left, show digits classified as trees, and the two 5x5 five five blocks on the right show images classified as five. Some of the digits that, uh, that the classifier gets wrong are the words, this guy over here and this guy over here, are so badly written that even a human <laughs> would have trouble classifying them. Example, I mean, those guys, like, they they really look like threes, right? Those fives right here and this guy right here, they really look like threes. So even a human would get them mistaken, right? However, most misclassified images seem like obvious errors to us. And it's hard to understand why the classifier made the mistakes it did. But remember that our brain is a fantastic pattern recognition system. And our visual system does a lot of complex pre-processing before any information reaches our consciousness. But the fact that it feels simple does not mean that it, it is. Now, the reason that the classifier made all these mistakes is that we just use a simple SGD classifier that assumes a linear model. All it does is assign a weight per class to each pixel, and when it sees a new image, it just sums up the weights, the weighted pixel intensities, to get a score for each class. So since 
threes and fives differ only by a few pixels, the model will easily use them. Three looks like a five because all what differs is just the head of the three. If you omit the head, then it's just a five, right? That's why they're really close and a linear classifier would have a very hard time segregating between the three and the five. So all in all, since threes and fives differ only by a few pixels, the linear model will easily confuse them. Now the main difference between threes and fives is the position, the small line that joins the top line to the bottom arc. Draw a lousy three and this guy is a bit like this, you know, the, the, the top arc is a bit tilted to the right, then this guy might be assumed as a five. Or let's say you just, you were writing three so fast that you missed the top arc as such right or such or even such right so try writing three multiple times it all the linear classifier would actually just you know classify this guy this guy if you mistakenly tilted this arc right here then the linear model will most probably mistaken misclassify the three with the five okay so one way to reduce the three five confusion would be to pre-process the images to ensure that they are well centered and not too rotated if you rotate the five too much it might also look like a three right this will help you reduce other similar errors as well thanks for watching if you enjoyed this lecture please consider subscribing to my channel liking this video sharing it on social media and if you have any questions whatsoever just leave a comment down in the comment section below i'll make sure i'll get to it as soon as possible